Hello, good morning everyone. There are still not so many of us and that's why let's wait. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, great. Let's wait a little bit further. Only three students and the professor at the time. Okay, good morning once again. Um, there are only six of us, unfortunately, at the moment. I'm wondering why. Any idea? Heavily celebrating the People Unity Day yesterday, or why? Okay. Let's start and those who are late will join us later. So today we will complete our discussion of the Bitcoin blockchain, complete with two very, very important technical topics. It will be, first of all, a very detailed discussion of transactions addressing, locking and unlocking, how it happens. Uh, and then about assembling transactions into blocks, hashing, mining bitcoins, uh, the consistency or consensus 
protocol, proof of work, and resolution of possible forks within uh, within the distributed block structure. Okay. So after we discuss all that, we'll be prepared first of all to do your labs uh, in which you are going to examine uh, the Bitcoin blockchain in detail by installing your own nodes and then using uh, API software actually to get access to blocks and uh, have a look at them. And secondly, uh, this would serve as a foundation to proceed to the second generation blockchains, uh, the Ethereum blockchain, uh, which uh, has smart contract or scripting capability, as we discussed. But as we'll see today, some little kind of scripting capability is even available in Bitcoin as well. It is not very widely known, but it is the case, actually, limited one. So uh, what I will do, I will share my screen, but because we now need both actually slides and the whiteboard, then I will try to show both. the whole desktop. Okay. How about this? Can you see can you see both screens? The whiteboard and slides, can you see it? Yes. Yep. Okay, wonderful. So uh let's have a look at transactions for the moment these are financial transactions actually we're sending bitcoins that the primary purpose of the bitcoin blockchain so first of all it must be understood that each transaction can be on, can only be built on the basis of previous transactions so basically uh, basically what happens uh, is that uh, you take an unspent transaction output and this unspent transaction output, if it was destined to you, uh, you can use it uh, to build further transactions from that. So there is a chicken and egg, I would say, problem because each transaction uh, as an, uh, the input of each transaction, for example, V in uh, here in uh, this list of transactions, uh, each uh, input uh, uh, each input is built from output of another transaction. And the other way around, uh, the output of a given transaction can, what is the fate of an output? It can become a UTXO, so for a while it is unspent, or uh, either immediately or later on, it can become uh, an input of another transaction. So in this problem, so what is the primary thing, uh, an input or an output of, of, of a transaction? When we consider how a transactions are built, uh, we need to start from somewhere actually, either from an input or from an output. The correct way, is to start from an output because an output uh, actually specifies uh, who can use it and only a valid receiving party of the output can then uh, use uh, this transaction uh, the proceeds of this transaction as a further input uh, as an input to a subsequent transaction that's how it happens so uh, let us uh, see, uh, for example, the formation of the output. If you can have a look here at uh, a particular output. Uh, so suppose that um, uh, this output is to be uh, used by, well, it is distinct for someone. So what do we say here? We say that we are sending uh, 0 0.015, uh, in this case, 
bitcoins, but the actual value or quantity of a transaction is actually specified in Satoshis in a binary format. This is not a binary format. This is a textual representation of a transaction, which uh, is easy to read, right? In fact, uh, it is uh, uh, specified uh, in Satoshis. N is just uh, the sequence number of this output. As you can see, this transaction actually has one input and two outputs. In general, it can be many inputs mapped to many outputs all of them within a single transaction and the fact that it is a single transaction uh, is marked by a single transaction id so we see the transaction id is outside the list of both actually inputs and outputs it is just a transaction id which which applies to all of them so in general a transaction is multiple inputs to multiple outputs and what is important is that all inputs are consumed entirely, as we have already uh, discussed. So each input uh, must correspond to an unspent transaction output of another transaction, unspent transaction output of another transaction, and uh, of which here this input uh, there is a transaction ID referenced uh, for this particular input. This means that this input consumes the funds which arrived to you in that previous transaction. So the unspent transaction ID uh, 795, whatever, whatever, is used as the input for this transaction. By the way, as you can see from here, uh, the amount of input uh, is uh, not specified here. So uh, why not? Because you can look up that transaction ID and then you will see actually uh, by the way, that transaction ID might contain multiple outputs. And only one output would, in that case, belong to you. What does it mean belong to you? We'll see in a second. And or maybe, maybe several of them would belong to you, but each of them uh, would have uh, the destination specified. And uh, from that destination, you can figure out, okay, that uh, amount of funds is for me, whereas maybe another output from that transaction was not for me. So your client software should be able to look up that transaction ID, which is referenced as uh, your input, figure out how much funds in that transaction are actually under your control, and uh, then form input uh, out of uh, uh, out of those funds, uh, out of those unspent uh, out of that unspent uh, transaction value, unspent transaction output. After that, that unspent transaction output, when it becomes the input of this current transaction 0627, will be spent completely. So the inputs are completely, completely spent. And actually what you do, you spend the inputs completely. You send a 0 0.015 BTC to your destination and you send the rest. Well, how do you know that it is the rest? Uh, because your client software has calculated that in those inputs, actually exactly uh, what 0 0.1 BTC is available altogether, 0 0.1 in the inputs. 
it's not clear here, but if this transaction ID is locked up, uh, and then you check uh, all those outputs which are under your control, which were sent to you, uh, then this means uh, you can calculate other from this input, it's 0 0.01, which was distinct to you. Okay, uh, so 0 0.1, 0 0.1. And of them, you spend 0 0.015 sending to someone, and the rest you are sending back to yourself. That's how it works. I think I have another diagram which depicts this. Um, yes, uh, it is actually um, this transaction. So you see 0 0.1 BTC was received. And now 0 0.015 are sent to someone else and therefore spent. Uh, the rest is arriving back to you as an unspent transaction output. Okay. Back to our description. So what does it really mean? That we uh, that a transaction is looking at inputs and is trying to identify uh, which uh, fans of that previous transaction belong to you, which you can use as your uh, as, as unspent transaction outputs in your subsequent transaction. So what what does it really mean belongs to you? In the most simplest case, you can probably answer this question. So in the most simplest case, it means what? When uh, when a transaction was sent to you, it means it means what? What does it mean that a transaction was sent to you? Maybe that you can use this funds uh, using your private key. Well, yes. So you can spend this as yet unspent transaction output if it was destined to you by using your private key. How exactly we'll now see. Uh, which means that if you can use it, spend it using your private key, therefore, it is your public key, uh, which was your destination address. So basically a transaction was sent to your public key at the destination address. Or more uh, specifically, I would say, uh, I would say, uh, this transaction uh, was sent to uh, the hash of uh, your public key because your public key is long and it was hashed to uh, some kind of uh, sent to uh, a hash of your public key uh, which is only 160 bit uh, whereas uh, public key, uh, the public key itself can be longer uh, than that uh, which identifies your uh, address. So basically what would uh, your, well, not just your, but each node's uh, uh, software do? And in particular, what would your client do? Uh, the client would listen to the blockchain network, receive blocks containing transactions, and look at the output of uh, those transactions and uh, check uh, uh, check uh, actually which uh, output really belongs to you. Uh, an interesting thing is Uh, so basically, uh, uh, your uh, own uh, wallet software, uh, it would uh, know, of course, your own public key. You would know the hash of your public key 
and uh, you would compare the hash of your public key with, uh, with uh, the destination address. Um, actually, uh, here we see um, uh, how the destination address is formed. So it is a public key, then it is hashed twice. First with SHA-256 uh, hashing algorithm, and then uh, with another hashing alg uh, algorithm, and that's why it is called double hash or hash 160. So what is important is that out of your uh, public key, uh, which uh, may be longer than uh, 160 bits, uh, you get uh, a hash uh, of 160 bits uh, only, which is uh, 20 bytes. And then uh, it is also uh, encoded uh, in uh, base 58 uh, symbolic uh, texture representation. And uh, that's how uh, it becomes actually uh, a texture representation of a Bitcoin address. So uh, you know the texture representation of your address. You compare uh, all, actually, that's what your wallet needs to do. Uh, it needs to monitor, uh, otherwise you wouldn't know whether any funds uh, arrive to you. Uh, it would monitor monitor all Bitcoin transactions, check if any of them uh, have a destination address which coincides with uh, that way encoded your public key eventually, and then somehow notify you, for example, display on your screen uh, in an interactive mode, uh -huh, you have uh, extra funds uh, uh, you, you, you probably have uh, extra funds uh, available uh, because the transaction has arrived. Okay, <clears throat> by the way, has arrived, as we will see. So we just received a block which uh, contains a transaction which was, uh, uh, which was destined to you. Uh, it does not immediately mean that you are free to spend it. Well, actually you can, but what may happen is that your attempt to spend it uh, would fail uh, for the reason that uh, the block which is just received may actually become removed later on uh, due to a fork uh, in the blockchain. <clears throat> So you already know that uh, a transaction was coming. Uh, it was even uh, embedded into a block which was just received. It does not necessarily mean that this block would not be very shortly overrun or overturned. And if you already submit another transaction based on this unchecked transaction output, then uh, this transaction would eventually fail as well if uh, the block in which uh, the corresponding DTXO has arrived uh, is later overturned. So we'll, uh, we'll uh, discuss this later today in more detail. So if you received some Bitcoins, in that case, it is better to wait for a little bit more blocks extending the just received block, then, uh, it is considered that when this uh, sequence becomes three or more, not just one, it is virtually irreversible. And in that case, you can uh, be absolutely sure that now, yes, you take you take your uh, funds as unspent transaction output and you send it further. In that case, uh, your transaction would most likely not fail. So, okay, uh, you know that this transaction was destined to you because it mentions your hashed, eventually hashed Bitcoin, uh, your, your hashed public key as a Bitcoin address. Okay. So in general, uh, when, so you use this unspent transaction output to build a new transaction out of it. But obviously, if you build a new transaction out of it, you need to prove to the system, which means prove to uh, the whole Bitcoin blockchain that yes, you are a legitimate holder of the corresponding public key. Because everyone knows it is your 
uh, knows your public key. The public key, the wider known is the better. So everyone can say, that's myself. I'm Mr. Donald Trump. Uh, Trump. So this transaction was actually for me. How can we distinguish uh, between those false claims and those who are a really valid, a legitimate recipient of the transaction? Uh, so basically the way is you need to prove this by proving that you are in possession of the corresponding private key, right? And this is done through the mechanism which is uh, actually called locking uh, and unlocking scripts. So let us see <clears throat> how this works. So now assume I'm not talking about us, I'm assuming, uh, so this is an output for some subsequent recipient, okay? That's uh, that's an output for them. So, or actually the second one, you see the second one is an output for us. That's uh, for another party. The second one is an output for us. That's where I'm getting change, okay? So basically this is destined to the same wallet. That's a good example. It is destined to the same wallet, which means to the same hash of a public uh, of a public key uh, as the original transaction from whose output we are building this transaction okay so this transaction 7957 and this uh, output therefore the same address that's for us is it clear This was the original transaction in which we received 0 0.1 BTC. This is sent uh, N0 sent to another party, whereas N1 is sent back to us. Okay? Sent back to us. So when we send it back to us, we in this transaction in this output we install the same requirement which is a requirement imposed upon us that the recipient must be able to spend to prove that they're in the possession of their corresponding private key uh, to use these funds further and you know what it looks uh, it is quite uh, um, quite an interesting thing. So uh, there is something which is called script pub key. So yes, uh, we are sending this transaction to someone who in the possession of uh, a certain public key. But interestingly enough, and actually the textual, repre textual representation of that public key uh, is uh, here. But why script? What does it mean, script public key? What kind of script? And then we have uh, a very enigmatic record here, ASM, which means assembly. And this looks some like some assembly language code. Oh, obviously, you have studied uh, Intel X8664 uh, architecture, the assembly language, maybe assembly languages of other CPUs, maybe byte code languages of some virtual machines, like Java virtual machine. Did you? So you are familiar with with byte codes and virtual machines. Yeah, yeah well, we were studying MIPS actually. You started uh, studied what? MIPS. Ah, MIPS. Okay, very nice instruction set indeed. MIPS, wonderful. Uh, old, but still evolving. 
although our Intel instruction set also has legacy back in not just 1980s but 1970s. So interestingly enough, you see all these instruction set architectures, including both actually Intel and PIPs, are very much long living. Great, yes. So this is also some kind of instruction set instruction set with some data embedded in it op dup which means duplicate op hash 160 aha computer hash then some kind of uh, binary interesting what kind of uh, then uh, then op equality verify op check seek something little bit strange here so that's actually how the transaction is formed so in uh, in fact it is just a binary sequence uh, but if parsed uh, it gives rise to uh, this uh, enigmatic uh, sequence of opcodes and binary data that's an interesting thing what does it mean okay let's examine this sequence in more detail this is a so-called locking script uh, which all together basically this assembly code ASM, provides a certain condition which must be satisfied by the recipient in order to use this output further in subsequent transactions so this is a uh, this uh, one uh, is a condition imposed upon us. Okay. So what is the condition imposed upon us? There is a locking script uh, with these instructions. Actually, uh, there are only four instructions here and one immediate operand as an immediate binary. Dup, duplicate, hash 160, we have already seen it. Then some kind of binary, which actually appears to be a public key hash of whom? Of your destination. So when you construct an output, this is a locking script, which is embedded in the output, which imposes a condition on who the recipient could be. So basically, in particular, uh, it contains a public uh, key uh, hash of the recipient. Uh, okay. Um, verify certain equality and then check seek. Strange, isn't it? What then happens by itself? Uh, it doesn't mean much. And uh, we need to consider a stack machine, which is uh, in operation on each uh, Bitcoin node, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin uh, blockchain node, which is able to execute these simple assembly instructions. This is a stack machine. So basically uh, what you have, you have operands on the stack and then uh, postfix instructions acting on those operands. So for example, if an operand is pushed on the stack and then dup uh, is issued, then uh, the operand is duplicated. So there are now two values. If there is a single value and then hash 160 uh, is applied, uh, then uh, the operand is replaced by its hash and so on. When an immediate operand is encountered, uh, then uh, it is just pushed up on a stack and uh, it is subject to subsequent operations. We'll just run through an example and see exactly how it works. By itself, this locking script is meaningless because it can only work, uh, for it to work actually, it requires two operands to be placed on the stack. And this is done by the recipient. So the recipient actually recognizes that, aha, uh -huh, 
uh, there is a public key hash and it is my public key hash which is uh, in the locking script of these transactions of this transaction then this means it's for me if it's for me i already know i have received something this means that when i build another transaction with an input based upon this output i need to provide two more operands sig and my public key now full public key what is sig we will see a certain signature which signature why signature let's see uh, in order to prove to the system that i am in a legal possession of the corresponding public key and i can therefore indeed spend this utxo which arrived to me so a utxo arrives to you with this locking script in order to use it further you need to build an input out of this utxo and provide two extra values these extra values are actually here in the input uh, in script sig uh, it is actually uh, again a certain assembly sequence long one as you can see which provide these uh, two extra values actually the signature and the public key and then uh, taken together with the locking script of the corresponding utxo uh, the system will execute both of them so basically push on the stack um, the signature and the public key as uh, the two operands uh, and then execute uh, the locking in script and uh, see if the whole sequence succeeds if the whole sequence succeeds this means that you have proved that you are in the possession of the corresponding private key so you indeed a legitimate destination of that utxo and you can spend it further and you can uh, therefore uh, the system can therefore process the transaction uh, which you entered uh, on the basis of that utxo so what does it mean so let's see um, what happens uh, so the first two operands are sig and public key so let's draw the stack so initially so there is a virtual machine a simple but a virtual machine not only in ethereum and subsequent uh, second third fourth generation of uh, blockchain systems but there is a virtual machine even in uh, the bitcoin node a simple one but nevertheless so initially our stack is empty okay so that's the bottom okay so that's initially empty then two values provided by us when we want to spend a previously unspent transaction output destined to us these two values are taken from our input our input specification and pushed upon a stack so it is a certain sig which we don't know what it is and our public key so because they are sequentially put upon uh, put into the stack then initially in the bottom there is a sig and then there is our public key all right that's what becomes of our stack <clears throat> then this stack is used at the initial stack state in conjunction with the locking script associated with that previous utxo this is basically a condition which will now be verified using the data we have provided so the, the, then uh, considering left to right 
uh, the corresponding logging script. What would the system do? It looks in the first operand, it is DAP, which means duplicate the most recent operand on the key, on the step. So now DAP is applied. As a result of DAP applied, can you tell me please how our step would look like now? After DAP. Signature public key and public key. Yes, sig, pub key, and pub key again. You are absolutely right. Now, the second assembly instruction is taken, which is hash 160. Which is, by the way, the same hash 160 as in here. So all this operation SHA-256 and then uh, a ripe MD-160, this is altogether double hash, hash-160. We can assume that it is just a single hashing operation, although internally, mathematically, it consists of two. So basically, this converts a public key into a public key hash, okay? So now, hash-160 is applied. What do we get on the stack? the top public key should be replaced with hash. But why two? The the top. Only the top. Each assembly operation only applies to the top operand. Well, if it is a unitary operation, a un right? It could be a binary operation, then it consumes two operands. But hash 160 uh, only applies to one. Therefore, you get exactly public key hash of 160 bit length. Then you have a longer public key, for example, 256, which is a public key itself. And then you still have this enigmatic sig. Okay. Now, Another assembly operation, which is equal verify, is applied. Ah, no, sorry. Now what, instead of equal verify, what is the next operation? What is the next operation which will happen? Please look here. After hash 160 is applied, so what is the next operation? The next operation is an immediate operand. In, uh, I'm absolutely sure, in the mix instruction set, there is also such a thing as an immediate operand of an instruction, not taken somewhere from memory, but embedded right here in the assembly language code. I'm absolutely sure there are, all right? Do you remember them? Can you remember them? Mix instructions with immediate operands. For example, I am absolutely sure there should be an instruction, put an immediate operand in a register, something like that. So the next instruction here is an immediate uh, immediate operand. Okay. So what happens, uh, that's number four. What happens with our stack? when an immediate operand is placed on the stack. Well, it is placed on the stack. What is this immediate operand? It is a public key hash again, but that's an immediate one. So it is a public key hash, the immediate one. Then there is a public key hash previously computed. Then there is a public key itself. And then there is a sig. Okay. 
So that's our state number five. Now, the next operation is indeed equal verified. This operation is a binary one. A binary operation which you can you can guess what it does. It takes two arguments from the stack top. If they're equal indeed, then it is a very simple thing. Then it does nothing. And it is considered it is considered that the operation has succeeded. But if they are not equal, it aborts the whole computation. So the whole computation fails. And the execution of this script is abnormally terminated. So basically what this operation does, it simply verifies eventually what have we done so far. So okay, suppose that uh, it is okay. Equal verify succeeds. Then only sig and pub key are retained on the stack. So what does it mean? We check the equality of the embedded public key hash, which was embedded into the locking script and specifying the destination address, and indeed uh, the hash of our public key. Can you tell me please, so why have we done this in the first place? Uh, does it really prove that we are the legitimate owner of this public key? Is it some kind of uh, really security and verification measure uh, that yes, uh, this output, uh, this unspent transaction output was indeed for us and we are a legitimate, legitimate spender of that output? What do you think? No. No, of course not. Because everyone knows your public key. Hash 160 is a completely open operation which doesn't carry any secret key or whatever. So anyone can do that. Uh, basically substitute your public key in a green field here. Substitute your public key and take a hash and it would really compare to be equal to, to, to that public key, to that public key hash. Your public key is known. Should it be unknown, then of course guessing the public key which would after hashing coincide with the public key hash is impossible. This cryptographically strong uh, hashing function is irreversible generating a collision, guessing, uh, guessing or uh, finding a colliding uh, public key which would uh, result in the same hash is impossible. But your public key is known. So we only verified so far that indeed uh, the hash 160 of your public key is the same as embedded public key hash. So what? What for? Why Maybe in the signature you sign this public key? We didn't arrive at the signature yet. Uh, so far we, we, we just uh, performed this operation uh, with uh, two public key, hash, with, with compu computing a public key hash and comparing with an embedded hash. The question is what for? What do you think? Three minute break to think what for, okay? And then we are back and we will provide your answer. A short break now.
Okay, we are back. So can you tell me please, so why did we perform all those operations? What was the point of it? You know what? The point is only for the sake of efficiency. In the next operation, and the next operation is check sig, we will indeed verify that uh, this is uh, this is uh, a public key which belongs to us. So the system will verify it is a public key which belongs to us. If simply this operation is relatively expensive, it is more expensive than uh, just hashing and comparing the hashes. So it is just a simple precaution for the case if, for example, we somehow provided a wrong public key or if uh, by mistake we believe that this operation belongs to, uh, this unspent transaction output belongs to us, whereas in fact it does not. So in order to, in order not to perform an expensive check SIG operation, we do a simple frontline check before that and this check would reject uh, our public key if its hash doesn't match the immediate operand, the embedded one, simply for that. So this is just for efficiency. Front end check. But this check provides only the necessary and very easy necessary condition of continuing the operation, but the actual operation, which is the essence of the whole procedure, is here, check SIG. So, now check SIG is applied to both our public key and the signature. Which signature? It is a signature of a certain message which was computed using our private key. Signature of some message. And then Obviously, this operation check SIG, it must take our public key, the signature, and the message itself. So implicitly, it also uses the message as the operand. And then uh, you remember we know how in the elliptic curve cryptography, if we have a message and the public key, we can indeed verify. Uh, and the signature, we can indeed verify uh, that uh, the signature is valid. So verification is simple, whereas the signature itself can only be produced uh, using the private key. So if the check succeeds, then our stack is empty and uh, it means that we indeed we are a legitimate, uh, legitimate consumers of this unspent transaction output. If the check fails, then the whole computation is aborted, and as a result, uh, our transaction is not processed any further because we are trying to use some unspent transaction output which does not really belong to us. Now my question is, okay, still, which message is used in this process. So basically, uh, we compute a signature of a certain message using our private key, put this signature on the stack, and then check sig uh, indeed takes a message and takes our public key, take the signature and verify that all three of them are consistent. Which message in this case? I would say, in general, it doesn't really matter. It can be any message, any, let's say, previously known message. So, for example, 
if uh, the big chain, uh, the blockchain protocol is such that it always assumes that, for example, this is some kind of constant message. So for example, the message is make America great again, for example. And it is a constant one. Then it would still work, because what you do, you take your private key, you compute a signature of this message, you put on the stack as we did here, the signature and our public key. Then the system would verify, knowing in advance that the message should be like this, the validity of the signature, and yes, this proves if check six exits are uh, on a well-known a priori known message, this would mean that you are in the legal possession of the corresponding private and public key pair. So this would do. With any other fixed message it would do. Or the message can be variable and in the Bitcoin protocol actually as such a message is taken uh, the transaction we are building itself. So in reality, the message is our transaction, but it doesn't need to be. It can be any, as we know. So in reality, message is transaction. Which transaction? The transaction we are building when trying to spend this particular output. So actually, this whole transaction, as you can see, uh, acts as a message, well, uh, uh, without some variable fields, obviously. So uh, in a little bit more detail, uh, how a transaction is treated as a message. Uh, we know that, uh, for example, um, uh, there are some uh, fields which uh, uh, we may uh, not know yet uh, at that time. And um, these fields are uh, zeroed out, but the essence of the transaction in particular, uh, the value, destination, the structure of inputs, outputs, and so on, they're all taken, serialized, uh, then um, a certain extra field, which I will describe in, in, describe in a second, is added to the serialized form. Then a hash is computed and a signature is taken uh, out of that hash. And that's why uh, taking uh, this transaction as an input message and again uh, zeroing out um, unnecessary fields uh, the system was able to eventually verify uh, that uh, the signature and the message and your public key uh, all match. So the message is uh, in a transaction. What kind of fields are zeroed out? Uh, let us see. Uh, there is a magic keyword somewhere here. Uh, which uh, actually specifies uh, what kind of uh, condition uh, you impose uh, upon this uh, transaction. Uh, let me see if it is visible uh, in this uh, if it is visible in this transaction structure. Uh, no, in this particular one you can't see it, but uh, there is a very important field which uh, actually says uh, to which part of uh, your transaction uh, your signature actually applies. So what does it mean? 
uh, it means that uh, you build a transaction with a given input and uh, a set of outputs. Yes. So typically, uh, this means that each output uh, has its own destination and uh, obviously uh, its own address which is embedded in the corresponding verification script uh, of that output. And for each particular output, the corresponding conditions uh, must be uh, matched uh, in order for the respective recipient uh, to be able to use it. But uh, you can uh, specify uh, and other types of transactions. For example, uh, there is a way to specify a very liberal transaction, uh, which can be, uh, imagine the following, uh, which can be consumed by everyone. There is a modifier field. It is not visible here, but when you examine uh, the transaction structure in more detail, uh, you will be able to see it, uh, which actually says, uh, that for this transaction, uh, yes, uh, the inputs are as specified. Uh, actually, this field is called seek hash. It is a seek hash type. But the output is not really signed. So the output is arbitrary. So you are making a transaction, imagine that is sometimes possible and sometimes even useful, seldom but, uh, but possible, that uh, the outputs can be any. Uh, this seek hash field uh, it has a value none in this case, which means that uh, none of the outputs are signed by providing this uh, signature. Which means in that case, uh, before uh, examining the validity of any subsequent transaction built upon that, uh, the system would zero out uh, all output fields because, uh, I mean, the addresses of output fields, the values are still to be checked. But the addresses can be any. In that case, they are zeroed out and uh, if in that truncated way uh, the check succeeds, then it is okay. Uh, there might be some other transactions on the other hand, interestingly enough, in which there is a single output, but no inputs. By itself, such a transaction is not valid, obviously. But uh, if uh, there is no input, no specified input, uh, then this means that uh, you can actually, uh, for a given amount only, substitute uh, any input uh, into this transaction. And uh, this is sometimes used in crowdfunding applications. So such a transaction would also be uh, checked as valid, uh, provided that the corresponding field is uh, specifically uh, uh, specifically installed in that transaction. So you specify your output without specifying any inputs, uh, but uh, then when this transaction is received uh, by the network, anyone is free to supply, if they want, of course, to supply their own input and build uh, a real transaction uh, which uh, sends the specified amount of money to you. Obviously, if they do not want, then uh, the system does not uh, execute this transaction automatically. Only if someone has willingly installed themselves as uh, the input in that case. Uh, the input part is then uh, not to be uh, checked. Okay, so that's in general how transactions are structured.
uh, normally in uh, all normal situations, uh, it is uh, a transaction in which this assembly sequence is checked and upon a successful verification uh, of a signature of the whole uh, transaction, uh, then uh, the corresponding uh, funds are unlocked and what used to be an unspent transaction output is now spent. It becomes the input of uh, the following on transaction. Uh, the node in, in the course of its operation, uh, the node keeps track of all unspent transaction outputs because subsequent transactions are built upon them. Uh, if uh, a new transaction is commenced, then the corresponding uh, unspent transaction output is no longer marked as unspent. So it is removed from the list of unspent, um, uh, of, of UTX uh, unspent transaction outputs, um, uh, UTXOs, and uh, cannot be used uh, anymore. Okay, so uh, that's a very important concept uh, which we have discussed. A virtual machine within uh, the Bitcoin uh, node. Uh, any questions before we move further? Any questions? On yeah, that? you said that um, we may use a special type of operation for crowdfunding. Yes. Does it mean that uh, yeah. once again we can only send money in this case, for example, for those purposes, if the amount of money is uh, really big. No, so, typically so that is small amount. So yeah. that uh, piece for per se, uh, processing our transaction will be not more than uh, our input, like our amount of money to send. In, uh, in the crowdfunding, when SIG hash um, had this uh, special value, um, which means, uh, which is that anyone can pay, anyone can pay to you. Uh, this means that uh, you specify the amount, but do not specify the input. Then anyone can substitute uh, their own input into this transaction. So here, for example, the input is uh, completely determined. So we know that for, uh, for this transaction, uh, the input, it is here in VIN, uh, there is a transaction ID, which serves as the input uh, to this transaction. In that case, there is a single output. Here we have two outputs. And in that transaction, there is a single output, typically for a very small amount, very, very small amount. The, uh, the output is your destination, your uh, wallet address, the hash of your public key. But in that case, anyone is able to substitute their own input uh, in order to proceed uh, with that transaction, which means in the digital signature, uh, when the digital signature of this transaction is uh, computed, then uh, the input is not checked because the input can be any. But the amount is fixed and typically small. But the question is, uh, let me extend my question. Like, uh, usually in crowdfunding, there there is a thousands of people um, who want to send money, and each uh, each one should pay uh, the fee for per processing their transa transactions, right? Uh, in that case, uh, what would happen? Um, so you would say that in that be, be, because, uh, the, the high because uh, the yeah. extra fees will be so big that it, it is not feasible to use Bitcoin or any other 
it's blockchain not that in this case. It would be uh, not feasible but we could say that uh, in that case the fees can become disproportionately high that's what you mean because actually in order to receive for example one btc i i believe your question is about that in order to receive one btc through crowdfunding it would split into 1000 individual transactions and each transaction uh, because the fees are calculated per byte rather than uh, per monetary value uh, there would be disproportionately high fees all right so that's the question correct yes uh the answer is not necessarily because if this transaction is part of crowdfunding nothing actually stops you from specifying zero fees it is crowdfunding after all so why should really uh, a member of this crowdfunding uh, community pay these disproportionately high fees so okay they're absolutely free to specify zero fees sooner or later this transaction would come into a certain block so that's okay fees are not compulsory the fees are required only to impose some temporary bounds on uh, how soon your transaction would be executed okay zero fees zero fees would do as well yeah okay then um, so we are done with individual transactions uh, there are some further details and these details might be interesting so there are different types of scripts this is not the only type of scripts available for example a script can con uh, can uh, contain a conditional and it would in that case be uh, it would contain, uh, for example, an alternative if then else with two or more addresses, which would in that case allow alternative recipients for this transaction. So this transaction is either for Mr. Trump or for Mr. Biden. Any of them, by proving that they're in the possession of the corresponding private key, would be able to receive a transaction obviously as soon as uh, it is received then the corresponding output uh, is uh, removed from uh, utxo list so basically uh, <laughs> the transaction succeeds in that case uh, whoever was the first person to receive it and so on so many ways actually this scripting language capability although it is a very simple stack machine uh, for example, it doesn't have loops. Uh, in order to have a loop, you need to have an if then else operator and then uh, also uh, some kind of flow of control, go to to the beginning of the loop. There is no go to in this assembly language. It is just a very simplistic uh, stack machine. Nevertheless, you can do non trivial things uh, with this script. And you know what? we may even do some in, in the labs we may even do some exercise uh, with uh, this type of scripting uh, moving i will think whether it is feasible to do or not uh, some tiny uh, tiny amount in satoshis okay if there is an interest to, to, to do that i think it might be a very good idea actually okay so now we know that transactions are assembled into blocks uh, there is a block limit uh, in bytes which is one megabyte in uh, the current implementation of uh, bitcoin uh, there was a heated debate uh, on whether this should be extended or not uh, currently it stays because there was no consent received and in the fear that imposing even by a majority vote imposing uh, let's say an increase from one megabyte to 10 megabyte uh, could split uh, the bitcoin the network which is undesirable uh, as a hard fork uh, then uh, the decision was not made and it stays at one megabyte now so a typical block is uh, about several hundred uh, kilobytes um, now let's really see i have already mentioned uh, this nonce uh, field 
uh, what happens, how uh, the whole system is secured by mining and uh, how the blocks are assembled in the chains and we really get the blockchain. A very important point just to understand. What is the purpose of mining and what is the mining in the first place? We already have seen that the mining is the process of solving cryptographic puzzles, of actually altering some fields. The most, uh, the primary one uh, is the field called uh, nonce. Uh, altering some fields which are allowed to be altered within the block, computing the hash value of the block and then aiming at the hash being less than the specified target. The target is actually specified by this bits part of the block. And you see just under nonce, there is a field bits. So what it means? It means that um, bits are uh, actually uh, eight uh, sorry, a four byte uh, sequence, as you can see here, all right? <clears throat> One, two, three, four, eight uh, hexadecimal digits. <clears throat> so <clears throat> these bits is a difficulty target. Bits are split into the leading byte, which is the exponent, one byte, and the three bytes of coefficient. And then the target is computed as coefficient. The coefficient doesn't really matter that much. It is just for adjustments only times 2 to the power 8 exponent minus 3. That's the formula. And what happens is that the target, because it is a coefficient multiplied by a power of 2, uh, it would typically have uh, a number of leading zeros. And indeed, the target which is uh, derived from uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, bits uh, has about as many leading zeros as the hash in the first uh, line of this block structure. So then by varying, by altering the nonce part, and some other fields which are allowed to be altered. I will explain in a second why it is important, actually. The miners are trying to get a hash of this altered block, only of those parts which are allowed to alter, obviously, are not allowed to alter the transactions. Um, in order to get the overall hash less than the target. Once you get the hash less than the target, you succeeded in solving this cryptographic puzzle and therefore it means that you as a miner are successfully, you have successfully hashed the block. When you hash the block, you can send this block uh, along with the modified fields, those which we were allowed to modify and the computed hash to all other nodes, maybe to one node and then we'll send it to all others uh, of the Bitcoin blockchain as a proof of your success in hashing. Um, so what is the primary purpose of uh, hashing? In order to hash it, you really need to uh, run through a sequence of uh, nonce values, possibly all of them, because there is absolutely no way to predict which value after being installed into the corresponding field of the block would result in the hash being less than the target. So it is an extremely computationally difficult operation. So what is the purpose of mining? What do you think? 
proof of work. Proof of work is uh, okay. That would be nice. You know, the purpose of mining is just to prove that you have done it. Spent a lot of CPU power, electricity, and congratulations, you are the world champion. You have done it. But what is the purpose? Uh, the purpose is uh, that the whole Bitcoin or any coin chain is based on the trust in something. Let it be uh, the trust in compute, uh, in work, in hard work. So uh, you may only be trusted if you have performed this operation and have found this uh, exact uh, hash value that fits below target. Well, generally, yes. So the whole purpose, and this is a very, I would say, genius idea behind the whole invention. Uh, so far, yes, we have seen uh, the application of a relatively fine, I would say, interesting cryptographic techniques, uh, how the transactions are built, how uh, we specify the destination address and so on. But this was still within uh, the classical framework of uh, public key cryptography, and in particular elliptic curve cryptography. So there was not so much highly innovative in uh, what we have seen so far. The real innovation of Satoshi Nakamoto or whoever uh, was this person was indeed the way of how the overall, the whole system is secured by this uh, hard work, basically. So it is really a protocol, really, yes, proof of work protocol, according to which uh, the system as a whole, uh, the combination of the system of working nodes, accept new blocks into the system if uh, it can be demonstrated that a very significant amount of work has been invested into, uh, into yes, generating these new blocks. So if energy has been invested into generating new blocks, then this means that transactions which belong to this new block uh, become, uh, I would say, uh, established and validated and accepted uh, for the moment, accepted for the moment uh, by the whole system. So the purpose of mining is, let me say that, securing the whole system by demonstrating the proof of your work. And the whole purpose of proving your work is, uh, Yes, uh, because the security protocol required that. Otherwise, anyone would be able to generate absolutely any blocks at any rate. And as a side product of this uh, proof of work, uh, blocks are generated relatively infrequently. So on average, uh, each block is um, signed, uh, is, is hashed every 10 minutes. Uh, for a particular individual, let's say miner, uh, hashing a block on average would require much, 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 much more resources. So even if uh, with the current cryptographic difficulty, uh, even if you are in the possession of a very high-end uh, GPU-based uh, farm, for an average miner, it would probably take let's say one month, two months on average, before they succeed in uh, securing a block. Uh, you can uh, actually compute that for yourself uh, because uh, if, for example, there are, uh, I demonstrated the statistics to you at some previous point, uh, there are uh, 10,000 roughly uh, mining or hashing nodes uh, working. Uh, there are millions of nodes operating at the same time, but they are just observing nodes. In your labs, you will install observing nodes as well. You wouldn't do mining, probably not. You would just receive transactions and blocks, uh, watch them, but uh, not try to hash uh, the blocks. So there are many nodes like that. The nodes which are actually involved in mining, there are about 10,000. And now you can imagine that if 
uh, 10,000 nodes, uh, there are 10,000 nodes, and uh, on average, uh, those 10,000 nodes uh, produce uh, one block uh, in 10 minutes, okay? Uh, so 0 0.1 block uh, in a minute, okay? So all together, 10,000, uh, they produce 0 0.1 block in a minute. Therefore, each node uh, of, of, of 10,000 produces obviously 10 to minus 5 blocks in a minute, right? Which means that for an average miner to produce, to hash uh, a block and to get this block accepted, very often it would happen that they start hashing a block and then suddenly they would receive uh, a block from someone else that they succeeded first. And it's impossible to predict who would be doing that. On average, it would take 10 to 5 minutes, 10 to the power of 5 minutes for an average miner to hash a block. Uh, okay, 10 to the power of uh, 100,000 minutes. So in uh, a day, how many minutes in a day? 1440, 1440. Therefore, on average, it would take 70 days uh, for an average miner to come up with a block. So over two months. And yet they do it. So although on average it is uh, over two months, then with this mining, you receive uh, a reward. Uh, what kind of reward? Here is the point where new Bitcoins are generated. But this is only a side product. This is a side product uh, to compensate miners for securing the net, for securing the blockchain network. The primary purpose, as we currently identified, is really to demonstrate this proof of work. And altogether, uh, you know that last year statistics had shown that 0.21% 0.21% of world electricity is spent on mining. You know, that the huge value that is equal to the electricity output of the whole country or output or consumption of the whole country like Switzerland. To some extent, uh, this means that, um, uh, let us draw a parallel. I will finish this lecture by a kind of economic discussion and uh, we will uh, discuss the rest uh, actually of how forks are resolved and uh, how the difficulty is uh, adjusted and so on, I will finish it next time. For the moment, I will just give you a picture of hashing difficulty and rates. Uh, this is uh, the total rate of hashing, uh, which is uh, what the letter E stands for, exa hashes per second, uh, which is 10 to, uh, if it is an American, it's 10 to uh, power 18, actually, hash computations per second altogether. Uh, the difficulty, uh, which is controlled by uh, the corresponding coefficient, is automatically adjusted as a part of the protocol uh, based on, uh, within each node, uh, based on uh, how many blocks uh, were hashed uh, over uh, the past period of time, or more precisely, uh, how much time uh, was taken to uh, hash uh, the previous, uh, for some reason, 2016 blocks. So uh, on average, it must be one block in a minute, okay? So one block in a minute, uh, sorry, one block in 10 minutes. So to be hashed. 
and the parameter which is used in the difficulty adjustment is uh, 2016 blocks for some reason this constant is used therefore this roughly corresponds to 20,000 minutes okay and uh, 20,000 minutes uh, you can see actually the distance between this uh, it is roughly uh, roughly two or three weeks uh, it actually depends because it's, it is not exactly 20,000 minutes but uh, this threshold when uh, a new uh, 2016 blocks are uh, hashed you see the height in the left column here is incremented every time by 2016. Uh, so last time it was just uh, two days ago. The previous time when a multiple of 2016 was reached uh, was um, on the 17th of October, then on the 4th of October and so on and so on. So on average, it is uh, over uh, 20,160 minutes, but in general, there is some actual time which is required for that. Then new target, new target encoded as those bits as a coefficient times a power of two at each of these uh, thresholds of 2016 blocks. New target is computed as old target. T actual in minutes divided by this ideal time uh, 2160 minutes. Um, obviously, if the actual time was less than this, how could it be less? A new mining farm was deployed. Then the new target becomes less than the old target. And you remember that lower target means higher difficulty because you need to perform more computations in order for your hash function to be lower than the target. Okay? So then the automatic adjustment, uh, how it occurs uh, within uh, the Bitcoin network. And the premium, the compensation for the miners which they receive for uh, these mining activities uh, also decreases from time to time when there is a so-called halving of uh, uh, of the miners uh, uh, miners not miners fees but miners premium which is encoded in the first as uh, a first transaction in the block so basically miners do uh, get compensated in two ways by getting uh, fees from individual transactions built into blocks miners compensation from transaction fees and this compensation will always be in place and per block uh, this is called coinbase there is a term for that This per block compensation is decreasing over time. It is decreasing every, so that's not the same as adjusting difficulty. It is decreasing or halving actually by half every 630k blocks. Oh, sorry. Uh, 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 no. Uh, every. Uh, let me double check uh, uh, how many blocks. Uh, no, definitely not uh, 630. So, sorry. Every n blocks need to check what is the value of n. Uh, historically, it used to be like this. From uh, from the inception in June two thousand nine to November two thousand twelve, it was fifty BTC per block. 
uh, then from obviously November 12 to July 16, it was half of that, only 25. From July 16 until very recently in May this year, uh, it was 12.5. Now it is only 6.25. I would ask you to find out actually what is the value of N embedded in this process. That's a little homework for you. <clears throat> and it will happen that in around as projected because it is a fixed number of blocks and we know that on average each block comes every 10 minutes. So in around, not so soon, uh, 2137, it will become only one Satoshi. And because one Satoshi is indivisible, then in <clears throat> very soon, 2140, it will become zero. From that point, there will be no more compensation for mining. So no coin-based compensation per block itself. It is already quite low, <coughs> but there would still be compensation coming from transaction fees. Okay. So let's probably stop at this point now. And uh, at the beginning of the next lecture, we'll complete our discussion uh, by considering uh, the forks in the protocol and how they are resolved. Uh, we'll do some economic discussion. And then from that point on, we'll move to Ethereum. But we are done for today. Any questions? Okay, that's fine. Thank you. And let's meet next Monday.